application of open knowledge using a prototype and textbook platform. And your presenters today are Erwin and Michelle. So please give a warm welcome to Erwin and Michelle. Well, hi, everybody. It's nice to see you here. And Michelle, I don't know how your voice is going to be working. We did have some audio problems this morning. So Michelle, do you still want to try your audio right now? I'll try my audio. OK, so I think we're still having the same problem with distortion and so on. So um, I'll, I'll kind of proceed for now, and hopefully things will sort out. So I hope you don't get too tired just listening to me. <laughs> I talk a lot. <laughs> so but uh, anyway. Um, I also want to acknowledge that um, um, Dr. Michael Pascovicius is also part of this development team. Uh, he's not able to be here today. And then also Tannis Morgan uh, has been quite involved with early stages, but in the later stages, she just became very busy with her work and was unable to uh, participate in this. But uh, we certainly want to acknowledge her work as well too. So welcome to this. Really glad to, to have you do this, uh, join us, especially at the end of uh, of, of the uh, sessions and we know that's usually when people are thinking about getting back to the hotel and the airport and all that so thank you for participating and i hope um, you find this interesting and helpful um okay i just am not able to advance the slide here uh, are you able to see that okay all right so i'll give an overview i think what Excuse me for a moment, because I've lost my slides. OK, so I'd like to give a land acknowledgment. And it's something that we do in Canada, and I think in many other countries around the world that have to acknowledge um, the fact that we do live on land that was colonized many years ago. Uh, and so and our universities exist on these lands. And we acknowledge with gratitude that the universities where we work and learn are situated on the traditional and unceded lands of Indigenous peoples, where teaching and learning have taken place since time immemorial. And that's something that we uh, keep in mind um, as we share the knowledge, not only that uh, we create here, but that we've gained so richly um, with from the peoples who were here many, many years uh, before us as well, too. So as an overview, uh, open textbooks, um, the, some of the thinking that Michelle and Tanis and Michael and myself did was thinking about open textbooks. We saw some examples of where um, not only were they some of the gains of, by open textbooks just better um, access to students in terms of cost, which of course was a wonderful thing to have. Um, and also sort of the traditional five R's, the so-called uh, five R's that we're using, but also the fact of open pedagogies, how to design into and part of open textbooks. And we thought, how can we extend uh, sort of that traditional use of the textbook as a traditional textbook uh, when we're using new textbooks, just beyond you know, having a, an ability to distribute them at a lower cost? And so one of the bigger questions was how, how does um, particular reuse and, uh, of content work within our instructional environments? And some, that's something that we kind of put our minds to. Um, you're familiar, I'm sure, with the five R's of openness, retain, reuse, revise, remix, the ability to uh, redistribute. Uh, and so the two areas that we're interested in particular were directing more focus on these three R's beyond redistribute. Um, so reusing and revising. How does that play out in the textbook? How can we extend those concepts to making open textbooks even a more uh, active and open part of our, of our pedagogies? Um, Kind of the early roots of this, and this is a blog post that uh, a couple of us put together after OER 17. So actually, come to think of it, this is kind of like a fifth year anniversary. Uh, it's amazing how long this concept has been developing. But several of us were in a cab heading back to our hotel after OER 17, which I think was in London. Was that London, Michelle? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and that was probably one of the first OER sessions where the, the notion of openness uh, beyond just OER, sort of the 
sort of the bare bones idea of OER and the copyright issues and Creative Commons and so on started to really open up for us, I think, in terms of the wider picture of social justice. And there, it was a really buzzy conference because uh, I think there were just new directions of thinking opening up. And so we got together in, in, in a Fonda Bridge tradition. We sat down in a pub, which is a great place to get some thinking done. Uh, and we thought, what are some of the other R's um, beyond the ones that are tied in with copyright? And these are just ones that we just kind of brainstormed over time. Such as, here's a few examples like resist, ruffle, reflect, reframe, reclaim, ramble, read, and so on. Um, with the idea that uh, there are so many more ways that we can extend just the letter R, which is just one letter of the alphabet, into different ways of um, expanding on the possibilities as, as of open educational resources and in this particular context, um, open textbooks. If you look at the last column, we think a lot about indigenization, starting from a place of respect, recognizing what has happened, relearning our histories, retelling our histories and learning how to re reconcile. So, so that was kind of like a, 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 I think a trigger moment for us when we thought we, we need to do some more thinking and how do we relate that back to textbooks where in some ways, I think we're still using old, um, older forms of pedagogies and just writing them over the potential of um, um, open textbooks. So how, how can we move ahead from that? Um, and so, Michelle, do you want to try your audio and see how it's going? How, how is it now? I've changed. It's not bad. Not bad. Not bad. Okay. Yep. So we'll try for a moment. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I might not last for long. So Erwin, please interrupt me if I start to go wonky. You bet. Um, so just as we were rethinking this, um, uh, the starting, we thought that a design-based research method um, might be the best way to try to work through all the thinking around coming up with a different format, particularly for OERs and OER textbooks. So we've been going through a process of um, analysis, exploration, design and construction, evaluation and reflection um, for about the past three, over three years, four years almost now, um, as we've gathered feedback and um, moved through the process. So I'll go to the next slide. So uh, we started with the analysis and exploration and um, we did some data collection and analysis. I'll just, we'll go into the details of this as we sort of go through the next few stages. So we um, tested the concept, we collected some data, and then we actually, through that feedback from people came up with a, um, some research outputs already. So we've done a paper that kind of looked at what it might look like to rethink the textbook and rethink OER resources. Um, based on that feedback, we've developed a platform and an activity framework that we hope can work with students to sort of honor the kinds of things we were looking at um, from that feedback from, from colleagues about what an open, um, an untextbook possibly could look like. And we are now in our stage of evaluation and reflection um, and a couple of phases of that where we've conducted some course pilots and um, developed a, a learning design focused reader based on this platform um, that we are just starting to launch um, and use again with students. So we're hoping that as we move through our project and we're just in this final phase of um, collecting data for another year, uh, well, this spring mostly, that we can um, then really think about um, sustainability and maintenance, how we keep this thing that we've built um, going, how we can spread and share the different use cases, the platform, the reader, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And how do you maintain a user community around this, this resource um, and platform and idea really of trying to bring in um, more student voice and, um, as, and sort of that critical approach into the learning design? So right. am, I, am I still good, Erwin, or do yep, you want to? you're good. Okay, I think I was supposed to do that. Sorry, we're distracted now that I haven't had my audio. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so our first analysis and exploration, and this actually goes back to like OER 19 in Galway, where we were um, asking people for their ideas and thoughts about how we open up um, our OER to, to bring that, as Erwin was talking about earlier, the social justice perspective, more equity, agency, student voice. And so we gathered feedback um, at four different uh, conferences and did analysis on those, um, on all of that feedback. So now a little bit more about the concept. And one thing that I just want to emphasize here too as well <clears throat> is that a tool like this is not necessary to generate this kind of a pedagogical approach. However, with, with sort of that entanglement, entanglement of technology uh, and pedagogy and the fact that textbooks are used so much, particularly in some Western countries, uh, to mediate teaching and learning, um, we thought it would be helpful to have a tool that can kind of promote um, this this kind of an approach. Um, in the data gathering that we got talking to people all around the world, as um, uh, Michelle was describing, these were some of the main uh, data points that came out of the um, analysis that we did from, from many, many big amounts of feedback. People wanted multiple perspectives or lenses rather than just linear univocality. So how can we build more perspectives or lenses into the learning, um, into the textbook. Uh, the classroom discussions, how can we have, bring in forums, reflective writing, and community generated text, rather than just text that um, kind of comes prepackaged into the learning environment. Also knowledge beyond the fixed object of study. In other words, uh, having a way in which it can be continually co-created, connected to the communities of learners from where they're at and from the needs that they bring to that particular learning environment. Knowledge is more contextual and distributed, um, that it lives outside of the classroom. Again, what the, the settings of, of the teaching and the learning in the classroom itself all influence the knowledge and how it is perceived within, within that learning environment. The wisdom of indigenous ways of knowing and connection, which involves relationality, uh, and how do we um, build relations to and from our the communities that we live in, the communities that we work in, the communities within the classroom and within the learning environment itself. How, how do we build that within the knowledge that we're building itself? Um, how do we conceptualize the ownership of knowledge uh, uh, within, within that same setting? And there was a lot of people said, why can't we have more shift in power relations among students, uh, instructors and institutions? How, how can we actually arrange a learning resource that can actually help facilitate some of these things? And so, um, just, so, the, so to, that kind of led us to a framework where we thought, if learners can take the content that's there and actually be involved in, and by content that's there, I mean that's originally seeded into the, uh, into the open textbook, how can they continue to extend and reframe? And you remember the, that um, multiple R's framework that came up earlier. How can they repurpose, re-extend, reframe, rebuild that knowledge, uh, respond to it, from different aspects, whether it's uh, if they say, I want to look at it, but from a different issue. Um, I have a different role perspective. One student is an administrator, another one is a teacher, another one's an instructional designer, um, or different lenses, the BIPOC lens, LGBTQ plus, and so on, a decolonizing lens, a lens from the global south. So um, we invite students to take the original content that is provided in what would be uh, traditionally like an open textbook and say, okay, you write another chapter. Uh, and we use the word chapter loosely, but another section that can continue to grow that particular resource. Or what setting do you come from? Do you come from a professional workplace? Do you have a community setting? Are you within the health setting, uh, a certain discipline? Um, so that's how we try to build it so that students can bring different perspectives, different settings different issues, different lenses, depending on what is important to them and use that as an exercise to continue to develop content and open up um, further perspectives on the original content that was 
provided. Michelle. Okay, so based on all the feedback, we worked with uh, Tom Woodward, who is a wizard of building platforms, um, and it designed it. With, we met with Tom multiple times um, and tried to build in some of the following pieces into uh, a platform that would kind of honor some of the the the, uh, the pedagogical processes that we were hoping for, um, including the framework that Erwin just um, presented. So we were, it ended up being a WordPress theme that we're using um, that has some customization and it focused on agency. So allowing students to um, be authors. And in at the moment, we have chapters, but we also have a section called Voices, and so students can respond to um, a chapter. They can then rewrite um, or respond to it um, in a voice. They can also then communicate with each other through via comments, and uh, we'll show a little bit of how that's working. Um, we looked at voice and again, empowered to speak with our own voices. And I think that's been very powerful for the students. It's a little bit different than them writing a blog um, as they're engaging with the content directly. Um, they can actually, um, the way it's built, students can, if they want, or participants can contribute anonymously. So there is a, a sense there that they can choose and there's lots of choice about how they want to contribute, if they want to put their name or not. Um, we tried to add in structure that's a little bit more non-linear so that we're not recreating the idea that a textbook is going to guide you step by step through something that you can enter at different places. Um, so that's not as easy to do as we had hoped. Um, so in the end, we do have um, various topics that are organized in a sort of linearly on a page, but they um, there's no um, structure for the textbook about how you should work through it. Um, we built in accessibility with UDL principles, and we also encouraged when we were doing our call for contributions to the learning design specific reader, um, you know, inclusion of multi multimedia and different forms of media. And then we wanted to ensure that it was quite interactive. And so that framework encourages the extending and reframing. And I think the framework um, from what we've heard from students who have used it has been really, really powerful for them. Um, and one of the things that we talked a lot about is that this kind of um, space could be quite chaotic um, and students sometimes don't know how to contribute. So that framework really gives them something to um, build on. It's a really nice foundation for them and it's really got them to shift their thinking, which I think has been really, um, really important. So in this, this is just an example of the, um, rethink learning design topics, and it's probably a little bit hard to read, but here's an example of how we tried to introduce nonlinearity. Um, the topics are organized, um, but you can, on the main page, you can choose all um, sort of anywhere to go. Um, and so this just came together a final, kind of in January, February, we had our final versions that we shared with authors, and we're still just thinking through um, how we want to to launch it for people to use. And we'll talk a little bit about that in next steps. So in each of these chapters, there's a framework provided that students can or participants can respond um, and create their own voice. So uh, how do we how do we engage that outside? Um, we're using it in the classroom right now, and I think that's its intention. Uh, looking for feedback as well on others who might want to use it and how they might want to use it. Erwin, do you want to add anything? We just have five yeah. minutes left, by the way, Erwin. Yeah. Um, just giving our time left. I, yeah. I'll just, let's just keep going. Keep going. Okay. Sure. Sounds good.
Um, and we just wanted to highlight very quickly the peer review process that we, um, we did an open peer, peer review process for this. So that was part of it. Um, and really the criteria is about um, that representing, um, being respectful of diversity, representing different kinds of knowledge. And we really looked for in each of those chapters, ways and activities for people to actually engage directly with the content. So it's not just a chapter, it's also a, a, an interactive engagement. Okay, and so very quickly, we'll just talk about the research that we're currently doing, because uh, we'd like to share. So on the right hand side is an example of one of the test activities that we did um, in one of my courses at Royal Road. So the prototypes now have been used in two different instances at Royal Roads. Um, Students have completed the, these activities in both courses and we're actually in the second year right now. So we're gathering another uh, round of feedback after they use it again, which is nice because they will actually be able to engage with the student content from last year. So if you look down on the right, um, you see that the issues, role, perspectives, lenses and settings framework is actually built in. That's at the bottom of each page. And we have quite a few uh, responses in each of those sections. So students have, have responded to the original um, reflect, respond, and reframe activity. There's some content there. And then they're also commenting. So you don't actually see the amount of comments. So there's three or four comments usually also on each. So we've done a first pass of coding um, and interviews with six students. And uh, we are, um, I'll, I'll keep going. So we'll talk about our results so far early. Yeah. So this is our first pass of coding. We're not going to get into this just to show that we're getting some really interesting feedback on everything from comparison to other resources to positionality, um, about critical educational technology, the value of their contribution, things like the value of openness um, and the utility of the framework prompts and so on. So a lot of uh, there's a lot of kind of uh, good reflection on from students on what it is they're actually doing here, kind of a meta metacognitive uh, mirror of, of, of how their thinking is expanding uh, as to how they're interacting with content that's given to them and what's the, some of the processes involved in extending and reframing it. Um, and um, this is just another way of looking at the, at the data. Um, so We'll continue to uh, process this data, and both Michelle and I are using it in our current courses, the graduate courses in the um, uh, Learning and Technology program at Royal Roads University. And then once we've done two rounds, then we will start getting more deeply into analysis and publish some more of the results and continue to modify the um, the tool as well, because, you know, we are that we always had the design based research framework in the back of our minds. So everything that we do with it continues to fold back into improving learning and improving the tool. And just a few comments from students, uh, and I'll read the first one. I'm from a very corporate learning environment. It was interesting to see how the same material or the same educational issue could be spread almost into, into almost like a spider web. So many different layers, depending on the setting in which you work and the setting in which the perspective from which you are learning. So it was really good to see different interpretations of one article for my peers who are in a very different setting for me. Yeah, and I really liked the next quote. This is a different way of engaging in content, which is looking for what you said, building and reframing and building and framing. So that that shifting is really coming through. Mm -hmm. The next one, you have to give up a little bit of control. It's a little bit like putting yourself out there. It's demystifying the academy, like this idea of, I don't know everything and I want to engage and I want people to engage with me so that we can learn together versus just always kind of relying on certain people who have all that knowledge. So that's kind of a reflection of uh, more of a democratizing approach to uh, learning within the classroom setting. Yeah. And the final one, it's about me. I mean, I'm the one living in this course in this moment in time um, and I have my other job and I'm engaging. So maybe I should give it my all like invest a bit. So I think seeing that they're engaging with others outside, possibly the community too, I think also has been impactful for them. All right. And I think we're out of time, but just a final wrap up. Um, so we're looking at um, 
different use cases for this. So the, we have the reader itself um, that's sitting on a platform, but we also have built the platform. So it might be that people are interested in the framework itself and the way it works with students. So we're looking at that, uh, how an instructor might take um, the current Rethink LD reader. And the link is there if you would like to um, take a look. It's some fantastic work from 12 authors, 12 author teams, really, and um, about critical approaches to learning design, a variety of topics. And um, if you would like to contact us and, and use it, um, there's a, a contact form on one of the pages in the reader. And then also maybe you want to take a copy of it and redo it, like use the whole thing in a course. So um, we're just trying to think through how all of those might work and what hosting might look like. Uh, doing a bit of further testing and analysis so we can make some changes from student feedback and then continuing the research as well. And I think that's it for now. And we don't want to wear